My name is Heather Valentine and the story that I'm reading today is called The Countess de Mar. The Countess drops her glass and grasps her throat as the poison tracks spidery lines through the veins on her face. As you rise from the floor, you see the Countess clutching her stomach, blood from the knife wound puckering between her fingers. You are paralysed as the abysmal mist passes over the Countess, weathering her hands to, to the bone, powdering her chalk-white face into dust. The Countess de Mar will die on the 13th of February, 1899. It's marked on her calendar. Across the decade that you have been her lady-in-waiting, she has mentioned it a number of times. Yes, I have known since I was a little girl. A woman read it on my cards. I remember her saying this while you combed out her hair one evening. She was not looking at you as you watched her red mouth in the mirror. A most unlucky day, particularly for me. She said this upon finding out that February the 13th was the date of her brother-in-law's birth. She has wondered on several occasions if this meant he was to be related to her death in some way, but eventually decided that no gentleman would be so brutish as to murder someone on his birthday. I just want to get out. Today of all days. This is what she told you this morning, looking at you knowingly. You called around all the travel companies on her behalf, looking for something leaving before noon. There was a private cabin available on a steam train going north. You unload her bags from the carriage and follow her, running your free hands along the gleaming green exterior of the train as you board. The porter is dressed in the little blue hat and jacket of a great northern railway employee. He leads her to your cabin and you trail after them. With one foot on the leather seating, you sling the, countess's, the Countess's bag onto the overhead rack. The luggage shelf collapses and the bag falls and strikes the Countess's head. You store the luggage above your seat. She's looking out of the window, the sunlight bringing out bright whorls of purple on her crushed velvet dress. You braided and pinned her hair yourself and now it sits in place behind her head like a wheel of licorice. She turns to you, her face warm. Daphne, could you fetch my book? You nod and drag the luggage back down. As you search for the book, the door opens and another smartly dressed steward steps in, holding a green bottle and several glasses. Madame, some newlyweds have offered a glass of champagne to everyone else in the carriage. May I interest you in one? The Countess de Mars roulette wheel spins. In this life, you do not fix your mouth over hers, hoping to suck the poison from her system. Nor are the events to follow complicated by a perfectly ordinary glass of champagne rendering the Countess inebriated. She nods towards the book in your hand. I get quite the headache when I read while drinking, she says. Very well, ma'am, the man says, and withdraws from your cabin. In the lives where she survives thus far, the Countess de Mar usually wins herself half an hour of blissful peace between the intrusion of the steward and his reappearance to summon the pair of you to lunch in the dining car. She reads her book and looks out of the window at the sunny countryside. You read yours, but mostly watch her until the time comes to leave paradise. In some of her lives, the Countess de Mar is one of two siblings and her death would make her sister the sole inheritor of the Damar fortune. And then an unfortunately high number of his lives, that Countess Damar's brother-in-law is indeed brutal enough to murder someone on his birthday. Sometimes he attempts to do the dirty work himself, either by sending the Countess the poisoned wine or by stabbing her in the dining car. A handful of times his brutality is matched only by his short-sightedness and the man he has hired to kill the Countess misses the train. In this life, the Countess de Mar's younger brother survives childhood and nobody is waiting to attempt or succeed at skewering her with a bread knife over lunch. In this life, your misfortune instead crosses paths with the misfortune of Professor Robert Henry Ward, an archaeologist returning to the north with a mysterious crown he unearthed in the Great Bog near Kilmartin. In some lives, it is merely a crown. In others, the apparition possessing it is merely a run of the mill ghoul. In this life, it is not. The steward leads you to a seat in the middle of the dining car with a good view of the window. You appear to pour over the menu meticulously. You're waiting for the Countess to order first so that you can order the same. At around the same time she decides to order the potato and leek soup, a thin white mist begins to emerge from the crown, creeping between the slats of the wooden crate housing it and the luggage car. At around the time the waiter delivers your order to the kitchen, it has reached third class. By the time it reaches second class, the blue uniformed staff are barricading the door to the luggage car. You watch them do it. 
A white haired man sitting further down the carriage, unknown to you as Robert Henry Ward, stands to question them. As the waiter begins to bring your soup, the mist begins to seep through the doors. You put your hand on your lady's arm and tell her to run. There is no life in which she doesn't listen to you. She runs to the far door and you follow her. As you reach it, you turn to look. A wall of wisps shimmer forward and the white haired man cries out as he crumples to the floor. His gibbering disintegrates as the mist crosses his torso and into his lungs. His mouth hangs stiff in silent shock and you know he will never scream again. Your heart sinks as you watch, shadowed by the feelings of other lives. The lives where Professor Robert Henry Ward sat with the two of you in the dining car and you struck up a friendship where he accompanied you on the rest of the day, where he witnessed the Countess's deaths with you. The life where you made it all the way to Lossy Mouth, only to lose her on the pier, struck down by the Count's man in the rain. The lives where after the tragedy of the day, he took you on as his assistant and became like a father to you. In this life, he dies without, knowing, without you knowing his name, but your heart drags all the same until your fear blocks out all other feelings. The driver's car is already locked. There is nowhere further for you to take her. Instead, you duck into the one of the first class cabins and lock the door. The Countess seems oddly calm. You shove the luggage against the gap under the door, hoping that will slow it down. You go to the window and try to open it, but it's bolted shut. It creeps into the booth and you feel your limbs begin to seize as it drifts towards the pair of you, towards her. But you will not allow it. You throw your stiff arm against the glass, beating it, beating it, spider webs snaking out from where you strike. You will not allow it. She does not move as the glass shatters. The mist is coming. As you feel your legs be begin to give out from underneath you, push her out the window and watch her beautiful neck snap against the tracks. As you feel your legs begin to give out from underneath you, you drag yourself half through the fragmented portal. Take my hand, you say, and she does. You jump together and roll across the dirt. Where her neck hit the metal at an angle now strikes your head. For a moment, your world is colours and pain. As the fog clears, you see that she is already running. You stagger to your feet and run after her. As she hears your footsteps, she turns an alarm, but slows as she realises it's just you. Her face is white. I thought you, she begins. Not quite, you finish. She takes your hand and you carry on through the field. Hot, thick blood trickles from your nose. The tall grass comes up to your waist and your skirt snags and releases, snags and releases as you run. Before you, the grass gives way to rows and rows of blueberry plants, just as tall but with space apart for you to run through. The Countess leads you on. You hear a distant call but can't make it out, then a bang. And the lives where she survives until the end of the day, the Countess de Mar dies of heart failure at one minute to midnight precisely. Here is where she dies today. James Donaldson, a farmer, has been losing whole plants to thieving youths from the surrounding villages for weeks. Today, he has decided he will not tolerate any more trespassers. The Countess de Mar's shoulder explodes in vibrant red, spattering the green leaves, the blueberries, her purple crushed velvet dress. She falls to her knees, frantic but lucid, screeching like an animal. You try to crawl across the floor to her, but the hired thug knocks her away with a backhand. You hold a handful of her dust in your fingers as the ends of your body start to feel cold and vague. The bag strikes her head, killing her instantly. The train carries on, leaving her broken body lying on the rails, alone. You crawl to her and take her hand, as a shot intended for you misses. You hold her head and meet her tearful eyes. Your vision is beginning to swirl, and her black hair has fallen from where it is pinned, cascading over her sticky wound. She will die a thousand times in a thousand lives today. In this one, you will get to tell her that you love her. The end. Thank you very much. So thank you so much, Heather. I really love that story. I'm so glad you shared it with us. Um, although it's made me very sad. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for I'm having okay. me, although I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, well, thank you for that. I, I want to ask you a couple of questions, some a little bit more mm -hmm. general and then some about that specific tale, if that's okay. Um, I'm interested, because obviously I found out about you and your writing through the Unspeakable project, um, the Queer Gothic Unspeakable book. So what other projects have you been involved in and how did you get into writing? Um, 
I guess I've always been interested in writing. I've always I always loved reading Jacqueline Wilson books and um, Garth Nick's books and Eowyn Colfer's when I was younger. So I've always just loved reading and stories and writing. I started seriously writing um, in university. Um, I applied to do a dissertation. My dissertation is a creative writing piece instead of an academic piece and was lucky enough to get in. And I then actually had to write things and hand them in. And it turns out that that was quite helpful in encouraging me to write a bit more frequently. And I've just been picking away at writing ever since. The Countess de Mar is actually the first um, story that I ever had printed. It was printed in a very obscure conference anthology at the University of Sheffield, I believe, one time in the Gothic. Um, I don't think it's really widely available. Um, but it was Reflight magazine last year. Probably the biggest other project I've been involved in is We Were Always Here, which is uh, an anthology of queer Scottish short stories. And mine is about a, a weird film projector um, because I like haunted technology, as you probably saw from my story in Unspeakable, which is about an MSN ghost. <laughs> Okay. So, I mean, did you write this particular story for that collection on Time in the Gothic or was it just a happy sort of coincidence? I'd been toying around with some of the ideas relating to it. Like I was watching a lot of Roger Corman, Vincent Price films, which is where a lot of my <laughs> gothic aesthetic comes from, probably. And I was playing uh, Life is Strange, which is a game that it has a sort of time travel element to it. Mm -hmm. And when I saw the call for time in the gothic, and I put those ideas together with the kind of idea of a romance that I wanted to write, um, it just kind of came together. So I did write it for that specifically. Mm -hmm. And I'm quite happy I saw the prompt for it, because otherwise I probably wouldn't have put it together like that. <laughs> Yeah, it's good. I mean, so what were the sort of challenges for you of writing that kind of mix of alternate timelines? Because I feel like you keep them quite clear in my head, like I don't get confused, um, even though I'm sort of engaging emotionally with all of that kind of different plethora of options, each of which makes me sadder <laughs> than the one before. <laughs> um, I guess the thing for me was having a clear idea of what I wanted to happen in the main timeline mm -hmm. and from then going through it I could figure out some of the different branching off points or um, uh, some of the other things that I thought of first um, like the mist that chases them I thought of the image of her being kind of disintegrated before I thought of what would do it mm -hmm. and then I kind of went back and put them together so I didn't really thoroughly plan it or anything. Um, I just kind of had to mark where I was doing things as I was going and then make sure it kind of all matched up when I was done. <laughs> Were you sort of working deliberately with kind of some intertextual elements? Mm -hmm. um, what, what were you working with? Because there's some that I was like, I wonder. <laughs> so I guess the most obvious one for me is the professor character who mm. is basically an M.R. James character. But like he's kind of got the same name structure as Charles Dexter Ward, the Lovecraft character, because that character is in one of the Vincent Price, <laughs> Roger Corman films, oh. but given a bit of a different take. Um, so the Ermar James was definitely one of the kind of big things I was bringing to it. Mm. And the, the whole like deaths on the train thing was a bit murder on the Orient Express, because I love that story. And don't always reference Agatha Christie on purpose because I just do it by accident a lot. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's quite an interesting way of doing this that, I mean, I don't want to give the reveal just in case mm -hmm. there's anyone in the world who hasn't found out the ending of Murder on the Orient Express. <laughs> yeah. But like that sort of surprise ending on Murder of the Orient Express has its own place in your story, but just mm -hmm. because of time, parallel universes, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. I think it, it was definitely one of the things I was drawing on was, um, you know, like the way that Orient Express has all of these different connections between characters and that's what gives the motive in relation to murder. Um, it's sort of one of the other things I was thinking of as I went through, like 
um, who would want to kill the Countess? That because that it kind of leads to a bunch of different ways and reasons that she could die, hmm. and then there's the ones that are a complete accident and not anything to do with her at all, and they're fun too. Yeah, I mean, there's part of me that sort of wants to follow each track and sort of why mm -hmm. the brother sort of figure trying to kill her and. I mean, particularly in each different timeline, is it the same reason? And um, I, I liked that sort of, it was an entry to a lot of different worlds. I mean, quite obviously, <laughs> that's the whole point of it, I suppose. Um, but I mean, I'm sort of interested as well in this sense of queering the Gothic, but I wasn't sure in your story whether this is a sort of queer rewriting or a queer engagement, or if it was more you're writing queer literature and you're also writing gothic literature and it's just a happy marriage together, if that makes sense as a differentiation. Yeah, I think there's definitely a bit of both. Like, I write a lot of queer stories. I naturally am drawn to write in queer narratives. Um, at least in part, it's part of the appeal of writing queer narratives for me is because it alters the power dynamics between the characters mm. as well as it being queer and fun like if I was writing a female servant with a male uh, with like, who was following a count around or swapping like having a male servant that was obsessed with their mistress it has a slightly different inflection than it being two characters of the same gender mm. so that ha kind of removing the idea of what would intergender dynamics bring to this uh, by just making them the same gender allowed me to explore a lot more of what I was interested in with the romance. Mm -hmm. Also the gothic obviously has a sort of tradition of very loyal servants like um, Rebecca is probably the thing that I'd watched most recently when I wrote this. Um, we have the very loyal Mrs Danvers who's kind of obsessed with her dead mistress and even if I wasn't riff I, like I wasn't necessarily riffing on Rebecca with the actual dynamics of those characters, but that is sort of what I was bringing in, what I was doing a kind of genuinely queer version of with the story. Rather than like the sort of the monstrous queer version that you get mm -hmm. in like Rebecca. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's completely like messing with my idea of the character now, this idea of it being <laughs> Mrs. Danvers. <laughs> She's <laughs> Danvers, yes. um, what is it? What's the word I'm looking for? Stand in. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> much more terrifying <laughs> well thank you so much for sharing with us um it was a great story and hopefully people will enjoy the discussion as well so thank you for now yes thank you for having me <laughs>